All right, so I think we will get started. This session, as I mentioned, is called Priorities and Roles, and here's an opportunity for us to reflect a little bit. We've kind of got into this conversation in the earlier sessions, in, all, in both of them, in fact, um, about the respective roles of the, the federal government, the provinces, and other levels of government, and in this case, we're going to be talking about First Nations governance. Um, and the, the um, commission report, as you may know, um, had a whole section on, on, uh, on Aboriginal or First Nations health, um, a, a major concern in this country. So we want to kind of use this session to reflect on what are the issues and the challenges and so forth, and what might be the respective roles. Um, and I'd like the conversation after this event to extend beyond simply those of governance, but also some of the roles of perhaps um, the other players in the system. I mean, Shalom Gluberman has already spoken about the role of, of patients patients, and we've heard a bit about patients and families, um, what is their role, the role of the public in the engagement in this kind of dialogue and uh, um, in, in underpinning um, the desires that are expressed um, in the healthcare system as, as it evolves. Um, also the role of critical providers of health services, whether those are workers or whether those are, are professional providers, physicians. People have talked earlier about the issue of compensation and, you know, how are we using the money and where might we be looking at ways um, to, uh, to use our, our health care um, dollars a bit more wisely. So I think we'll have an opportunity in this. We'll have three 15-minute presentations as we have done before. We'll hold the questions until the end, the questions and the comments, and then we'll engage in some dialogue following that. Um, our first speaker is the Honourable Kelvin Kenneth Ogilvie, who's the chair of the Senate Standing Committee on Social Affairs, Science and Technology. And uh, you may know that his report is, is just outside, for those of you, there's a few hard copies, but there's also um, on our website and on the link to this program, uh, you'll see a copy. I, in fact, I wasn't supposed to call it his report, the Senate Committee report. Um, there are copies of that available. Um, he'll be followed by Honourable Deb Matthews, who's the Minister of Health and committed to being the Minister of Health. We had a good little conversation about that at lunch, but doing an amazing job here in Ontario to uh, move the agenda forward. And then our third speaker will be Joe Gallagher, who's the CEO of the uh, First Nations Health Authority in British Columbia. And this is a brand new radical departure from uh, the kind of um, First Nations and Inuit Health Branch delivered services to First Nations. This is part of a tripartite agreement between the province, the feds, and the First Nations in British Columbia that's quite unique in the country. So let me call now on the Honourable Kelvin Kenneth Ogilvie. Thank you uh, very much and uh, I want to uh, uh, indicate that first of all the report uh, that uh, was referred to, uh, there are our executive summaries outside and you can get them if you contact uh, uh, the website. And inside the executive summary is a CD that has all the full report uh, in it. The uh, title of our report was Time for Transformative Change. Some of you may say, well, why two terms together that indicate change? Change is a pretty weak, work when it, we're, weak word when it comes to bureaucracies. And so we decided we would add transformative to imply that uh, we expect something more significant uh, than just uh, the the traditional way. The second thing I want to say is that um, I'm appearing here uh, as requested as chair of the Standing Committee on Social Affairs, Science and Technology for the Senate of Canada and uh, as an individual. I am not here representing the Government of Canada and I therefore want to take entire responsibility on myself for whatever uh, I say uh, today. The um, Report, uh, we reviewed, my committee reviewed the 2004 health, record, uh, health Accord at request of the Parliament of Canada and the, I'm supposed to point it back, is it the middle button? Yes, there it is. Now, the um, first thing that I was asked to do was to summarize what we found. And our review of that accord suggests, to me at least, that those on the ground in provincial health care systems understand the current funding uh, the, of the system as a whole uh, is adequate. Now, we heard from everyone below the political level across the country. The people on the ground were, did not include those at the political level. 
but from deputy ministers on down in all organizations that represent health care in the country. The overwhelming conclusion was that the money in the system is adequate to deliver health care meeting the expectations of Canadians, but it is not doing so. And the areas in which problems lie include the overall political management of the provincial systems, which has led to a collection of silos, fragmentation of delivery, very little innovation, no accountability for key players. And payment for services is a major inhibitor of innovation. These issues, as I've indicated, silos, but doctors are not responsible to anyone. As you heard this morning, they are private businesses contracting to the provinces. And they are not accountable. If you look at the uh, health budgets in any health district, it doesn't include doctors' fees, doctors' costs, uh, or fees only as it relates in some way to the uh, hospital system. The patient must be the center of focus. That occurred over and over and over in the testimony uh, before our uh, committee. The electronic record. It is a disgrace that after the amount of money we have spent in this country to establish an electronic system that we don't have an electronic health system in this country. One doctor from a major hospital here in Toronto pounded his fist on the table. I don't care if I can't get the information from Calgary. I want to get it from down the hall in my own hospital. The issue is that every doctor was given a chance to purchase their own software, and most of them don't interface. The issues of access to integrated care, home care versus hospital care, specialists out of control. If you've got a major issue, diabetes, heart uh, disease or something, and you go to a hospital and you've got something wrong with you at the moment, it may be that you'll have to see several specialists. Those looking at your heart, nutrition, uh, uh, perhaps infection, a couple of other things, and diabetes, certainly circulation. And what do you do? You get a calendar that says two months from now you'll see the first one and three months from now you'll see the second. Six months you'll see the third. If you took your automobile into the dealer with a problem in the motor and they told you you've got to schedule over the next three months to repair it, what would you do? You'd get out of there in a heck of a hurry and go across the street where somebody could actually deal with it properly. The repetition of services and so on and that kind of delivery is an enormous cost to this country. Follow the money. The current system of remuneration is inhibiting innovation. Ontario has had a number of examples where groups of doctors have come together with nurse practitioners and others to try to form clinics that would allow you to come in with a broken leg and be dealt with there instead of having to go to the hospital the minute they tell you what you knew when you came in with that you've got a broken leg. But the system doesn't seem to be able to cope with a clinic sending in a bill for having done several things together. And many of these have had to, uh, or have been ordered to, uh, close up uh, their approach. So it's the way the bureaucracy interprets the, interprets the way the, uh, health accord, uh, the Health Act allows payment that's inhibiting a lot of innovation, in my opinion. Uh, other issues that arose, prevention. The lack of emphasis on prevention of illness, that is, looking after your health, Take, giving, returning personal responsibility to individuals. Canadians have a feeling that the health care system should cure them of everything, no matter what they do, including standing outside the hospital, smoking while they're recovering from major heart surgery, and so on. Wait times. One of the things that uh, it was clear in our study, we, we all think wait times is from the time you first enter the system and you get treated. It isn't. It's from the first time you get to see the specialist who assigns uh, and decides to treat you that the wait time is calculated, not from the time you get to your, your GP in most cases. The overwhelming recommendation from those who appeared before us 
that any additional funding going into the annual increments in health care in this country should be used for innovation. It should be used to fund innovative practices. Archaic systems. Elderly patients with multiple problems, heart disease, diabetes, etc., multiple drugs in their, their recommendation. They're shuttled through the health care system from emergency services to acute care home and institutional care and so on. Dialysis, etc. The patient is not looked at as a system. Your automobile is looked at as a problem. There's a problem in the motor and there's several things related to it. The individual patient is not looked at that way. I just, uh, you know all this, but I think it's worth putting in mind because I'm going to move towards some of the things that I think we learned out of all of this. Canada's standing in the OECD with regard to a number of indicators is not good as of 2009, 2010, but we are quite good in the amount of money we spend in terms of spending a lot. Uh, while we're 16th to whatever in terms of uh, performance, we are 6th in terms of percentage of GDP. That is, uh, we contribute, and um, as of the, um, the calculation, the average Canadian family of four now pays approximately $11,400 in taxes for health care insurance. You ask Canadians how much health care costs them, they say it's free. Some free. A major impediment is the interpretation at the provincial level and perhaps even at the federal level, of the Canada Health Act. It is simply a financial act that provides the terms and conditions under which a provincial government will be entitled to its full ca cash transfer. Health care is a matter, in terms of policy, is a matter of exclusive provincial jurisdiction. And it is therefore outside the jurisdiction of the federal government to set health care policies to be followed by individual Canadians and Canadian businesses. Now, we heard this morning that there should be an interaction between the federal government and the provinces. But you cannot have the provincial governments using the cost of health care and bashing the federal government on the amount of money they get from the federal government as the sole dialogue in this country. That is a waste of time. It is up to the provinces to use the money they get in innovative ways to change the health care for their citizens. It may be more convenient to argue that the reason that health care in a given province isn't meeting expectations is because that darn federal government isn't giving enough money. But that's an excuse. The responsibility resides at the provincial level. Provinces should cooperate with one another. You want them to cooperate with the federal government? Get them cooperating with one another. Why should Atlantic Canada, the provinces in Atlantic Canada, not be cooperating with one another? They have common problems and so on. Uh, my, I chaired the committee that reviewed the H1N1 pandemic response in this country. The transformation from the SARS epidemic to now, in terms of the provinces quietly cooperating with one another and the federal government to establish a pandemic response, has been remarkable. It's gone unheralded. There's no dialogue problems in the news all the time, no bashing one another over who pays for what. They have quietly worked together to dramatically improve Canada's ability to respond to, to serious major issues like pandemics from the time of the first SARS crisis where we had nothing essentially to uh, today. There is no reason that that should be a model for the way the federal and provincial governments work together through their officials in a cooperative manner to uh, deal with many of the other issues. Get stop trying to blame one another for whose fault it is that somebody didn't get good health care because one or the other isn't providing sufficient funding. The health care policies are not clearly restricted by the Canada Health Act, but they are not, in my opinion, pursued by provinces. To allow private ownership of hospitals and medical facilities, that the interpretation of the act is that's allowed to permit the creation of privately funded health care sector, so long as there's no sharing of the costs with the private system. 
and to allow, allow dual practice for physicians. That is occurring to uh, some degree. So, and I'm quoting here from the Government Interpretation Manual, manual of July 5th, 1984, by Andrew Duffy the, uh, that was reported in the Ottawa Citizen recently. So clearly, the provisions of Section 8 of the Act cannot be interpreted to mean that services cannot be provided on a for-profit basis. That was in a document to advise the government of the day as to what the Act meant. Just a couple of quick observations. Gwen Morgan has indicated that 70, or reported that 76% of Canadians support a mixed mo model of health care. Charles Wright of the Health Council of Canada said, as for urgent cases, the public system will decide when their pain requires care. The individual cannot decide rationally. And the Supreme Court of Canada in 2005, the Day case, says the evidence shows that delays in the public health care system are widespread and patients die as a result of waiting lists for public health care. So, as an overview, we can have all of the fine objectives and the high-sounding mission statements that we want for a health care system. But until those with the responsibility and the authority to implement and manage health care can develop the skills and determination to do so, we will continue to underserve Canadians. With certain defined exceptions, those with the responsibility and authority to implement health care are the government's of the provinces. Now, one of the things that you heard this morning or saw on a slide was a comparison of pharmacy costs to individuals in a number of countries showing the US and Canada to be very poor relative to a number. And if you uh, recall from that slide, the Netherlands was one of the uh, lowest costs to individuals. In fact, in one chart, it was nearly zero. I urge everyone that's concerned about the issue of public versus private, all of this kind of stuff, to look up and see what the Netherlands do. Private health insurance is a major reason for why you saw those numbers up there. And the government takes into account those who can't afford it. There are models out there. It, what we need in this country is to stop bashing each other over the costs and get down to bringing about some innovation. For something with the amount of money going into it in this country that healthcare does, to have had such little innovation over the last 40 years when once Canada was leader is now not even mentioned in any international comparison of innovation in healthcare. Innovation has got to be the basis and provincial governments have got to understand that in order to meet the needs of their, their citizens with the money that's available to them, innovation has to be the major driver and that's not going to come by counting pencils. And so my view is that we've got to get on with it and thank you for your attention. Well. I had a really nice little speech prepared, <laughs> but I'm not feeling it right now. So I might just, um, I might just change a little bit about what I was gonna say, because I have to say that, I mean, I, I don't know if anybody else is feeling like they've been scolded for the last 15 minutes, but I sure feel like I've had a 15 minute scolding and just told to innovate more. That was the only constructive thing you said, and I think you would agree that we are innovating. If you knew what we were doing in Ontario, you'd know we are innovating and we're accelerating that innovation. You know, for me, Canada is more than 10 provinces and three territories. We can do so much better when we work together. Ontario's a big province. We've got lots of capacity. We've got lots of smart people. We've got academic health centers. We've got the critical mass of, uh, of patients with specific conditions. But not every province is Ontario. In fact, Ontario is the only province that really has as much as, as Ontario does have. So we're, we're okay if the federal government 
chooses to be an ATM machine and only an ATM machine. But that doesn't reflect my Canada. That doesn't reflect the values of Canadians. Canadians were asked just a couple years ago to choose the greatest Canadian in the history of Canada. The greatest Canadian in the history of Canada. You know who they chose? Yeah. Exactly, they chose Tommy Douglas, the father of Canadian Medicare, because that's how much we value healthcare system as Canadians. Now you might say, provinces, you go work it out yourself. And I can tell you, I've uh, been health minister for uh, three years now. I've been to, I think, four federal, provincial, territorial ministers' meetings. We do and increasingly are working collaboratively. But when you've got 13 different jurisdictions with 13 different premiers and 13 different governments, it's very hard to drive the kind of change that a federal government showing national leadership could drive. So um, let me just kind of move to some of the innovation that we are driving here in Ontario and talk about where I see uh, the future, of, uh, the healthcare system going in the future. We really are driving excellent change. There are many people in this room who are champions of that change and drivers of that change. We know we can do better. Uh, you know, some of the statistics you, you um, um, recited, I recite them too. We can do better. We know when we look at international studies, we're spending a lot compared to other jurisdictions and we're not getting the outcomes that we should given how much money we spend. We need to do things differently. For me, the most exciting thing that we are embarking on now is we're really starting to focus on people with the greatest health care needs. You know, David Henry from ISIS is here. Tell me if I've got these numbers wrong. The top 1% of health care, um, the, the consumers in this province, the top 1% consume about a third of our health care budget. The top 5% consume about two-thirds of our health care budget. So 95, the healthiest 95% consume one-third. And the healthiest 50% consume 1% of our health care dollars. So for me, when you're looking at what do we need to do differently, I'm reminded of that old expression, if you're going to go fishing, go where the fish are. And I tell you, where we really need to get a whole lot better is looking after people with complex uh, health needs. Many of them are seniors. We, um, we provide lots of care, but we do not get the best care for the best value if you look at the whole patient experience. Now, I, I have become fond of an example that I use that I think demonstrates how we should be doing better. And I'm just going to um, read a story of Bernice. And there's Barbara. Bernice is actually Barbara's mom. And Barbara has shared this story with us um, because she thinks that we all have something to learn from her mom's story. So, so Bernice, imagine Bernice, an elderly woman, lives alone. Uh, CCAC visits once a week. Uh, so she gets home care once a week. Her kids are regular visitors. One day she falls, gashes her arm. She calls the ambulance, goes to the hospital. They fix her up, send her on her way. Nobody tells her doctor, her family doctor. There's no follow-up care. The CCAC is surprised, the home care is surprised when they come the next week and see that she's actually uh, had a fall and been to emergency. A year later, she has another fall, breaks her hip. Another ambulance trip to the hospital waits three days in the emergency department. They then, send, they then tell her, we're gonna send you to another hospital for surgery. So she gets transferred to another hospital. This is a true story. She spends, she has a surgery, spends six months recovering in the hospital. Uh, she gets MRSA. She sells her house and moves to long-term care. So that is Bernice. In five years, we spent close to half a million dollars caring for Bernice. Did she get the right care? Well, probably every step of the way, the provider did give her 
the best care possible. But as a system, if we look up and looked at her whole course of care, did she get the best possible care? Absolutely not. What should her care look like? Well, this is how it could be. This is how it will be when we transform our healthcare system to meet the needs of people like Bernice. So she lives at home. CCAC comes once a week. Her kids are regular visitors. One day she falls, cuts her arm, calls EMS, they come, they fix her up there at home. They also notify her doctor uh, and recommend a geriatric assessment. So they do a geriatric assessment. Her kids go with her. They get advice on how the, they can work with their mom to improve her functional ability. She's enrolled in a falls prevention program. Uh, she makes new friends at falls prevention, starts going to bingo. One night coming out of bingo, she falls and breaks her hip. Well, she's taken to her local community hospital. Staff there call the designated referral hospital. She's transferred there, has her surgery right away, transferred back to the community hospital where she recovers. Uh, um, a week later, she's discharged to transitional care. She's there for a month, and then she comes back home, and she gets all the home care she needs so she can stay at home. If we treated Bernays that way, with proactive care, where we anticipated problems ahead, and supported her in her journey, the cost for Bernice would be about $100,000. So we can spend $500,000 providing her care where she ends up in long-term care, a long-term care home, which is, admit it, where nobody wants to go, or we can spend less money and get her much, much better outcomes. So as our population ages, and it is, and as our population grows, as it is, we really need to start working much, much better as a system of care, thinking about the needs of individuals. For too long, we've thought about our hospital budgets, our physician compensation budget, our drug budget. We look at our budgets that way. We need to really focus on the high users and we need to look at them from a much more holistic perspective so that we can be much more proactive. We can get them the care. It's integrated care, care provided by not just doctors, but a range of healthcare providers to keep people where they want to be, and that is in their own home. We're starting to see some terrific movement in this direction. And in Ontario, we're We've, we've appointed Dr. Samir Sinha, a, a wonderful gerontologist who's developing our seniors care strategy, work, building on the work of, of people like Dr. David Walker, who, uh, who has done terrific work for us. Um, and we're really, we're really flipping healthcare on its head, where it's actually, we're asking the question, what does this patient need? What does this person need? or what does this kind of person need? And then we're gonna to have to work together to make the system wrap around the needs of that person. Instead of what we have now is we have a person who has needs, and then we try to cobble together through the existing limitations of the system, a fragmented kind of care and not nearly proactive enough. So there's a lot of work ahead of us, uh, but I think I think in Ontario, we're really on the cusp of doing a lot of that kind of change work. I'm gonna give you one other example, and I don't know if there's anybody from London, Ontario, my London, hello. So this is a, my hometown, London, Ontario. The, the, like every emergency, or like every hospital, acute care hospital in the ICU, there are people who are spending their life in ICU because they're ventilator dependent. So. I can't imagine what it would be like to live in an ICU. I don't even really like to visit them that much, but to live in an ICU 24 hours a day, lights are on, noise. So, but there are people living their lives in an ICU because they're, they're dependent on a ventilator. Well, somebody said, well, what are the needs of this person? Let's start with one person. What are the needs of this person and why do they, can these needs be met only in an ICU? So what they've done is they've actually moved 
I think now two, maybe more people out of ICU into supportive housing in the community. They get round the clock care. They're getting the, the, all of the care they want, but they're living in a neighborhood, in a community. with They can live their lives as normal as they possibly can. It's fantastic for the individual. And it's saving the system $685,000 a year. I mean, that's just, the system has to, we have to start thinking differently. We have to look at people, we have to identify their needs, and then we have to get out of the way and make the system work for that person. That's our job, that's the future, and I'm really excited to be in a position to actually make some of that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Matthews. Okay, I'm going to call on Joe Gallagher now. And as um, Greg started his presentation this morning, and now for something completely different. So this is going to be a bit of a departure from this um, two ends of the two bookends here. But Joe, I think you've been caught in the middle many times over the years. Thank you, Lillian. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the um, First Nations territory who this, who were on today, the Mississaugas of New Credit. And um, as mentioned, I am from the Tlaman Nation of the um, Coast Salish Nation on the uh, west coast of British Columbia, just a little bit north from Vancouver. I, I do thank you for making me feel at home and putting me in the middle between the feds and the province. That's um, <laughs> a very familiar situation that um, maybe helped make this a little bit easier. I was um, thinking a lot about um, how best to address the group and uh, the, I guess the best thing to do is just to tell you a little bit about what's happening in British Columbia. And um, from reading some of the notes on the Romano report that came out 10 years ago, very clearly we know that there are issues that exist among First Nations and Aboriginal people, including the jurisdictional gaps, um, the, uh, the need to consolidate resources and con continuity of care that was recommended in the report. Um, in British Columbia, as you know, um, and, and I guess in, in around the whole country, First Nations people really have to receive services from a multi-jurisdictional system. Federal government has some responsibility, provincial government has some responsibility and not always there to deliver it if you're living on reserve. So as a result, our health, comes are, health outcomes are very poor and I think everyone's aware of that. Um, so with, with the work that's going on in British Columbia, it, and it started back in, in 2005, so we've been at it for a little while now in terms of establishing a new relationship uh, with both the federal and provincial governments. And what was key to that was a document called the Transform Change Accord. Actually interesting that we used that term earlier. Um, but, but an agreement between First Nations leadership in British Columbia with the federal and provincial government to make improvements in the social and economic um, determinants gaps that exist between BC First Nations people and other British Columbians or Canadians. So that creates the space for commitments at a tripartite level to make improvements in health, education, housing, infrastructure, and economic development, as well as with a, a need to, to still um, address the, the need to reconcile the rights and title of First Nations people in British Columbia with those of the Crown. As you know, or many of you may know, that in British Columbia we do not have many treaties. We have a few historic treaties and a couple of modern day treaties, but most First Nations communities are, are left without treaties. So that creates an interesting environment in British Columbia moving forward. Over the past seven years, we have several plans and, and agreements that have been put in place. We've been making a lot of progress. And, and really, the result of the new health partnership in BC um, can be kind of um, wrapped up in, in a quote that I'll give you from, from Chief uh, Doug White at our Gathering Wisdom for when we're bringing our leadership and our provincial and federal partners together. And his statement was that the health and well-being of my people depends on my ability to work with each and every one of you in this room. And it's an important consideration because I've heard people say that. We need to learn to work together. So the, the work in British Columbia is based on that premise. We've been able to divide the work into two streams, one around um, health actions, which are identifying the, uh, the services that should be available for First Nations people. In the commitment in British Columbia, the province has agreed and acknowledged their responsibility for all aspects of health services and that those services are available for all British Columbians, including BC First Nations people, regardless of whether they live on and off reserve. That's a huge statement in British Columbia, because as the minister just stated, 
the, the small group of people that are driving the health costs up, First Nations people are overrepresented in that population. We're the fastest and youngest population, fastest growing and youngest population in the country. And we also have the worst health outcomes, so we are a major cost driver. So I think British Columbia and Canada are, are quite smart in coming into this new agreement in, in the province of BC with the First Nations. The work that we've done over the last while in relation to health actions really has been a little bit of what you just saw, bringing the federal and provincial governments together. We have tripartite strategy tables addressing each of these major areas of health issues and services. And a lot of that was introducing folks to one another who worked side by side but never spoke to one another on and off reserve across British Columbia. So it's an interesting development to see them now sitting and understanding that they do need to work together and that they do have some common problems to address. The provincial government has an innovation and change agenda in BC that's looking to transform its system. That transformation is a lot like what people have been talking about and what I've heard today. And, and they're struggling in terms of trying to find a way to get, get there and move those things forward. But they're committed to it, and it's really important to see that commitment is there. The health plan that we have and the, the wishes of First Nations people align very well in terms of our philosophy to health and wellness. So the, the work going on on the other side of it is around First Nations governance and the importance of recognizing First Nations' right to make decisions over the things that matter to them the most. And what we're very clear with our federal and provincial partners when it comes to our health, both the federal government and the provincial government does not know how to take care of the health of First Nations people. Thus, we have the situation we have today after all the investment and all the concerns of money and programs and access that, that are out there the government of British Columbia and the, province, uh, the of Brit and the government of Canada recognize the importance of First Nations people playing their rightful role in, in their own health and wellness, but also in the design and delivery of programs and services for First Nations people, and not just the services that we deliver to ourselves in our communities, but that First Nations health issues are a common thread throughout the entire system. They also recognize that we should be involved in the monitoring of our health outcomes. For too long, the government just tells us how sick we are. We never look at how well we are. And First Nations people like to look at health from a wellness approach as opposed to looking at a health system that's around us that really is there when you're sick. And it really treats you when you're sick. And it does very little to help you stay well. And, and that's where you need to understand the history of First Nations people in the context in which they live to understand why that won't work. And that's, that's a long explanation that we'll leave for another day. Um, I think some of the developments on the governance side that have been really important for us is that there's a commitment by the tripartite partners for a new governance structure, as I mentioned. It includes the First Nations Health Council, which is the political advocacy group that represents all British Columbia First Nations in BC. It includes our First Nations Health Directors Association, which represents the health managers working in our communities, running their health centers and our health programs. It includes this new First Nations Health Authority, which I have the honor of being the CEO of. We've been the First Nations Health Authority now since the middle of August, so it's not been that long, but the organization that I'm part of has been doing the work in terms of the operational aspects of implementing the health plan for a number of years now. The governance structure also includes a commitment of the federal and provincial governments for a series of meetings. So we have meetings with the minister, the assistant deputy minister from Health Canada on a regular basis. We also have a tripartite committee on First Nations Health, which is a table where our First Nations Health Authority, our First Nations Health Council leadership, the leadership from our First Nations Health Directors Association sits together with the Assistant Deputy Minister from First Nations Inuit Health Branch, who's responsible for the federal spending on First Nations Health in British Columbia, as well as the Deputy Minister from the province and the CEOs of each of the regional health authorities and the provincial health authority in British Columbia. So all the people that have decision-making responsibility over the resources spent in British Columbia for First Nations health and other health care sit at the table trying to work together to solve these problems. So I think it creates a great opportunity where we also then look at um, the ability to make progress and we hold ourselves together through the notion of reciprocal accountability. The reciprocal accountability for the first time where First Nations people, the province of British Columbia and the government of Canada sit together and ensure that we all work together and take responsibility for our own actions within whether or not the plan is successful or not. And that's a big recognition of an equal table where we need to sit together to address problems. First Nations um, 
have done a lot of work to organize themselves to do a better job of looking at the provincial system around us. So we have 203 First Nations in British Columbia. We have five regional provincial health authorities. And each of those administrative boundaries that the regional health authorities operate in within all the First Nations within that boundary have gotten together to form a regional table, a regional caucus and a table. And now four of the five have partnership accords with the regional health authorities for the first time where there's a commitment to work together on health planning. In the past, the provincial government would provide an Aboriginal health plan. The federal government would support communities to develop community health plans, and never the two should meet. So people had no idea in terms of how and where they should go. On the primary care side of that, and we, we talk about that as one of our main objectives in terms of making improvement as far as the health actions to go, too many First Nations people only think of primary care as going to the ER or at the hospital. And we all know that's not the best thing to do. So the work continues um, with, from a First Nations perspective to align and to, um, to, to look at the accountability of the provincial health authority who is the major service provider. Uh, the work there also uh, leads to the engagement of First Nations communities through the regional caucus process and other capacities that we're putting in place on the ground to ensure that we can break down silos that have been created even among ourselves in terms of 203 Indian bands delivering programs and services through a lot of very small administrations. So the communities are starting to work together and to plan together and to bring to the health authorities real commitments and priorities that they're expecting the province to deliver on. So it's really changing the environment and it really has reinforced the community-driven, nation-based approach that's been taken in British Columbia by BC First Nations. In addition to that, the First Nations Health Authority is working closely with the Ministry of Health and will develop a relationship with the Provincial Health um, Services um, Association of British Columbia, the Provincial Health Authority that covers um, things like children, families, hospital, cancer agency, and so on. We, with the provincial government, with the ministry, we've started a discussion now to um, launch a for what they describe as a project board where we can sit with the executive of the ministry to talk about the implementation of the tripartite plan. And we need to clearly recognize that the, um, the work that is going on here is to try and ensure that there are accountabilities of all aspects of each of our respective systems to one another. So in the past, we've struggled with the notion that the provincial health system is set up in a way where the authorities are accountable to the ministry and not to First Nations people, but by having regional tables with each of the regional health authorities, we're trying to create that responsibility and that accountability where it belongs. The um, Ministry of Health in directing the health authorities and sitting with the um, First Nations Health Council and the First Nations Health Authority and the government in Canada at the table talking about the tripartite plan is becoming a lot more transparent in terms of how they provide direction to the health authorities so that we ensure that the direction they're giving the health authorities does not um, create barriers to their ability to work effectively with First Nations communities. The um, First Nations Health Authority will be focused on a health and wellness approach based on a health and wellness philosophy that First Nations are, are constantly working on. It looks at the notion of the First Nations individual or the human being in the middle and it focuses on the notion of ensuring that every, each and every one of us can be the best human being we can be in our daily lives, in raising our families and what we bring to this work. The First Nations Health Authority is going to be an, an organization that's very unique in British Columbia and anywhere in Canada. It will be a provincial-wide First Nations health organization built on the cultures and values and principles and philosophies and teachings of First Nations people. So we have the opportunity to do something that's a lot different and have had a lot of positive feedback from people that work in the provincial health system because we'll be able to focus on the health and wellness piece. We'll be able to be a champion of health and wellness. And our goal is to be a partner to each and every First Nations individual and community on their own, on their own health and wellness journeys. And so for us to be able to achieve that will really turn uh, turn the, um, the whole current existing sickness system philosophy on its head where we know that that system wants to get to the place of promotion prevention, we'll be able to focus on it and yet still have a table to deal with the improvements that are required in the, in the acute care system that we need. The, um, the, the opportunity to integrate with the provincial health system around us is really the big opportunity because the First Nations Health Authority is going to be, has been created and will be working towards in the next few months um, between July and October of next year, the transfer of all the federal resources that are delivered in British Columbia to support First Nations health services in our communities to the First Nations Health Authority. 
the federal government will still be in a relationship and a partnership with the First Nations people in British Columbia through the various agreements that we have with the First Nations Health Authority directly, as well as the Health Partnership Accord they're signing with the BC First Nations people as well. So they'll stay at the table and we'll, we'll look at a shared learning opportunity back and forth so that the improvements made and the learnings in British Columbia can be shared with the rest of the country. The integration with the provincial health system, though, is really the big opportunity because we already know the provincial government spends more on health care in British Columbia on status Indians, and that's with poor data, than, than the federal budget that we're taking over. So it's, it's going to be an opportunity for us to ensure that the province can work with us to determine a better way to spend the resources that they have. We've descri often described our discussion with the province and the federal government um, around the implementation of the health plans as a place where we've actually created a table for real innovation. That we have an opportunity based on the political will to implement that health plan to try things that the province would like to do but is taking a bit longer to get there when they have to work through the bigger system around us. So we have an opportunity to address rural and remote uh, health issues because First Nations communities aren't going anywhere but the province of British Columbia as probably like in, in many jurisdictions in Canada have centralized services to try, and, um, to try and cut costs. And that leaves bigger demands on services out in the rural and remote areas. So First Nations health centers are out there. And some of our First Nations health centers are already providing services to other British Columbians. So there's an opportunity to reconcile that and to ensure that we can have a full partnership with the province to improve the health care, not only for our First Nations people in our communities, but other, also other British Columbians living in, in our territories. And so that's an exciting proposition for us and it will make a better quality of life for all. The table we have will also deal with social determinants. We have a commitment in our agreements with BC and Canada to look at those other areas that impact the health outcomes of our people. In addition to that, um, I guess, uh, you know, the really goal of it for First Nations people uh, in our minds is to bring together the best of modern medicine with that of our own traditional teachings, knowledge and philosophy. And that will be the, the basis in which our health model and our health and wellness model is put together. So in closing, I just wanted to say, I know that there's, from this session, I can tell there's good news and there's bad news. <laughs> the, the bad news is that um, a lot of Canadians are disappointed with the current state of the health system, and it sounds like for at least 40 years. And, and with that, First Nations are even a little bit more disappointed. Um, the good news is that you know what to do to fix it. And the good news is also that in BC, we're already starting to do that. So thank you very much. What a great hopeful, hopeful message for us. And we have so much to learn from this experience as, as it unfolds. All right, so we have some challenges laid out here for us. A hopeful message, but some challenges. So um, I know that Charles Wright was referenced here, and he's in the audience, a member of the Health Council of Canada. Maybe I can call on Charles for some, some, uh, some feedback here, some starter comments. And, and is Danielle Martin here in the room? I think Danielle's somewhere here. And so then we'll follow up with Danielle. Hey, Danielle. So Thank we've got you. two physicians here. to. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I, was, I was hoping to comment on the subject of the day, but circumstances forced me into a preface. That quote ascribed to me would be a profoundly stupid thing to say. <laughs> Senator Ogilvie, you really need to get your staff to stop getting their fact checkers from Fox News. <laughs> I, <clears throat> this is now the fourth generation of that misquote, and I will tell you its exact history. Dr. Brian Day and I had a vigorous debate 25 years ago in British Columbia at which we debated private versus public health care. I, of course, was extremely uh, committed to public health care. And among many things, I, I presume, I can't even remember because there is no record of it. I remember having a debate which certainly dealt with uh, uh, the issue of waiting lists and uh, maximum capacity and that the administration uh, and there are ways of making decisions for priorities and when patients get access. Brian Day had an interview with Reader's Digest 1992, I think it was, uh, it's referenced in your Senate report, 
And that quote was Brian Day's, not mine. Brian Day said, you know, Dr. Wright said this and this. He was setting up a straw man because it looked so ridiculous. But the Reader's Digest put it in quotation marks from me. It was Brian Day's interpretation. And then that was subsequently picked up recently in the Globe and Mail by Gwyn Morgan and unfortunately by the Senate committee. Anyway, so be it. All right, well, uh, just let me get you to pause for one moment then, because yeah. this isn't what I anticipated you saying, but perhaps the senator would like at least an opportunity to respond to that. And then we'll get you to make your comment about the system at large. I, I would be happy to uh, delete that. It has nothing to do with the overall points I'm making, except just an additional uh, comment. It's, a, it's irrelevant to the uh, case I'm putting forward, and I'll be delighted to remove it. Thank you. Anyway, uh, the subject of the day clearly is to look back a little bit and to look forward a, a little bit in relation to uh, Mr. Romano's report. And uh, there was very little, if anything, in that report which I did not agree with at the time. And we, we, we have made progress. All the speakers have referred to measures of progress, measures of uh, less than progress, and measures of failure. We've made advantages, definitely in access, particularly with relation to the, uh, the, the chosen few, if you like, among the surgical services. Primary care is underway, certainly, although, as has been said repeatedly, it's so varied across the whole country as to what's happening. Home care, the focus on chronic disease management, information technology really is a terrible story for the country, but let's hope we'll, we'll get there. The Health Council of Canada, uh, which unfortunately was also embarrassed by that misquote. Anyway, the Health Council uh, was set up, albeit in a very constrained form, from the version that Mr. Romano proposed in his various recommendations. And fi finally, in terms of the progress, uh, the, the issue of a national pharmacy program of some kind is a complete mystery to me why it has been uh, simply not followed. I mean, if, if there was anything in there that would be a win-win-win situation for the feds, for the provinces, for the public and the patients, that's it, but it just hasn't been pursued. But now let me come to my, my main point, and it, this has been made many times, actually by Senator Ogilvie, uh, which I agree with, I'm about to emphasize, and this morning uh, by Greg and by Steve and, and many others. What I see happening is a very profound change in attitudes in some respects. The word transformation has been added to the agenda everywhere you turn now. It, it sort of developed from a continuous quality improvement, all kinds of measures to embed quality into our healthcare services. But the word transfer, transformation is more recent. The problem is that nobody really means it yet. What we see is all the advances we make, and we're continuing to make them every day, they're all nibbling round the edges of the core issues which have been outlined by uh, the speakers today. They're not getting at the core problem and the frustration here for many of us, particularly all the researchers amongst us, is that, w you know what? We do know what to do. There is abundant evidence, particularly over the last 10, 15 years, but even before that, as to the things that have to be done to achieve a high-performing, <coughs> high quality, efficient healthcare system. And they've all, they were enumerated just in the last presentation by S Senator Ogilvie. We need integration, longitudinal patient care integration, not cooperation, which is the best we achieve now. In fact, what we call cooperation seems to often devolve into a kind of passive aggression. We, where the management of a hospital, oh yeah, we talk to these guys, we, we talk to them every week. Uh, instead of integrating care, distributing services, team formation, I mean, we know that's an essential. These are all enablers which you can see in any of the high-performing systems that we all know about. There are many in the US, there are many internationally. 
funding basic funding structure reform. And once again, that is underway, in, in certainly in Ontario and in, in other areas. Professional scope of practice. How long have we been talking about it? It is absurd that we do not deal with that, particularly in relation to advanced nursing and uh, pharmacists. Physician remun remuneration. How long are we going to put up with the system which is known to be antithetical to the changes that we need to make, namely the fee-for-service system? Incentives to best practice. We know a terrific amount about best practices in all kinds of uh, areas. Appropriateness of care. That was appropriately mentioned today many times too, including drugs and technology. And outcomes and cost effectiveness which cannot be left out of, of the equation. So finally, my question for the panel. <laughs> <clears throat> Do you believe that any, or I, perhaps I should say all of these Features which are known to be necessary to achieve what we want to achieve. Do you believe they can be they can be achieved without direct governmental policy drive and legislation? Right. We'll start with Minister Matthews. Yes. Yes, they can be achieved. Is that mic on? It's just my phone. I'm losing it. Sorry. Yes, they can be achieved, but no, it cannot be achieved without significant government oversight. F we mentioned funding, legislation, regulation. Government needs to be there to drive it, otherwise it simply will not happen. Obviously, provincial government's huge role. We could do it so much better if as a nation we embarked on that. Well, in a, in a, a constitutional uh, situation that we have here, very clearly the responsibilities in these areas define government uh, and the role of the provinces. So uh, very clearly uh, uh, governments have to be involved in the uh, uh, long-term issue. And I think that uh, my own view is that uh, uh, now that the uh, rubber has really hit the road in terms of where we're going in long-term funding, that there will be an extra incentive uh, to focus on the changes that are required to uh, redistribute the uh, funding within the system to, in uh, hopefully innovative ways uh, that will, uh, as most people within the system seem to believe, uh, that the funding is available to uh, achieve the kind of health care Canadians want, but it's going to require uh, significant changes in the way we deliver it uh, and the uh, systems we use to deliver it. Joe, how about a comment from you? Help or hindrance? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I think it's, it's an interesting discussion to have, and I sitting between the federal and provincial perspectives, don't want the First Nations governance perspective to be forgotten because I think that um, as government tries to make big changes, we know, and as I've said, Ottawa has done many things to us from Ottawa out there in British Columbia that hasn't worked. So you have to be mindful of how you move decision-making closer to home to where it belongs for the certain kinds of things that belong there. I would uh, just like to add that uh, I did, obviously I didn't have a chance to uh, go over all the things we heard during the uh, uh, hearings on the health accord. But uh, in fact, uh, the north uh, is an area where there have been some very innovative uh, things that have occurred. Uh, the distances between communities and individual centers, uh, the uh, number of jurisdictions that are involved in, in working together. And quite frankly, they have done some very innovative things and probably among the most innovative uses of technology uh, has been in terms of uh, delivery of health care across uh, northern communities. And we saw a remarkable willingness of uh, the uh, people involved in delivery of health care to work together uh, across the jurisdictions uh, to try to achieve health care delivery to widely dispersed centers. Excellent. We'll go to the gentleman here, and then we'll go to um, uh, Danielle, if we may. Sorry, I, I can't quite see. Just here. Sorry, Danielle. And then um, to Danielle. Paul Brown with the Erie St. Clair Local Health Integration Network. And I'm also on the Board of Research Institute, the Gateway Rural Health Research Institute, which along with, I think, Raymond Pong at Laurentian University is focusing on the unique needs of rural health care. And Gateway is located in Seaforth, Ontario. My question that started to come out of this session this morning was regarding the, uh, 
the presentations that were very good. I gave them all A's this morning. And that was, is there room for the federal government to initiate a second model, or more accurately called the competitive model of care, starting with primary care, that taps the strength of the non-privileged providers and builds from there, and talks about Pharma Care 2020, et cetera. And part of that relates to the, not only the presentations that were made, because we know the Hall Commission was referenced, and uh, the Hall Commission begat the Lalonde Perspectives Report, and that Lalonde Report begat the Romano Report. And uh, Justice Emmett Hall's two volumes of leather-bound Royal Commission sit on my bookshelf above my Mac computer. And in the front page of that, of the uh, Royal Commission, is the signature of the Minister of the Department of Health and Welfare at that time, which was around 64, 65. The Minister was Waldemar Teeth from Stratford, Ontario, and he was a member of the Conservative government of this country. So, all of the primary care initiatives that were identified in there are owned by that government and they made a commitment. So the reference this morning to disengagement should not be referenced now to say uh, we don't have any responsibility to play in this. And I, I know the senators probably read that document quite a few times. So that's why I say there's some, some good presentation. And Joe's presentation referenced to primary care in the northern parts of this country and what's going on with the tripartite uh, initiative may bear a lot of lessons for primary care in this country for the rest of our health services. And I think maybe in conjunction with the provinces, we as citizens would expect that to come from the federal government and the provincial government in unison. That is an integrated approach. Thank you. Did you want to respond? Uh, well, I, I would just uh, uh, make an additional comment uh, because it has come up a number of times today, the issue of of uh, catastrophic uh, drug coverage and so on. And uh, we did make recommendations in these areas. Perhaps I could just read it. It's recommendation 28, that the federal government work with the provinces and territories <laughs> to develop a national pharmacare program based on the principles of universal and equitable access for all Canadians. Improve safety and appropriate use cost controls to ensure value for money and sustainability, including a national catastrophic drug coverage program and a national formulary. That's one aspect of what you were saying. <laughs> I urge you to read our report. There are 48 recommendations. Excellent. Okay, we'll go to Danielle, and then we're going to go to Mike, and then we'll come to Robin, please. So Danielle, and then Mike McBain, and then uh, Robin Tamlin in the front. My name is Danielle Martin. I'm an overpaid and unaccountable family physician in the province of Ontario. <laughs> and I'd like to pick up a little bit on this question of innovation and what kind of innovation actually occurs on the ground in healthcare when the public good is the driving force behind that innovation. And what kind of innovation happens on the ground in healthcare in Canada when the profit motive is the primary driver of that innovation? The kind of innovation that happens on the ground when the, the distributional uh, uh, effects of ill health are taken into account, when the social determinant drivers of ill health are taken into account, and when the complex needs of the patients who need our care the most are taken into account, is the kind of thing that we heard the minister describing. It's about better care for our frail, complex, elderly patients in the community. It's about taking care of children who have mental health disorders. It's about taking on the most ill-served, difficult to serve, and least profitable patients in the system and wrapping care around those people. The kind of innovation that we actually see taking place in the system when profit is the primary driver is at best over-serving basically healthy people and distorting what the general population believes to be appropriate health care and at worst cutting services or undermining the quality of services for our most vulnerable people, and I think we have actually ample evidence of that in the long-term care sector in Canada. So not all, all innovation is created equal, and not all innovation actually serves to improve health 
on the ground, and I think it's critical that we keep that in mind. Now, as a doctor, I'm all for innovation, and I'm actually all for accountability, something which I would say we don't, Charles, actually know how to do that part yet in Canada, and there are lots of really smart people in this room who I would love to put uh, their minds to the question of how do we start to tackle that critical question that the senator raises around physician accountability. I don't actually think we have the structures yet or really have much knowledge of how to do that given the institutional setup of the Canadian healthcare system. But as a physician, I'm all for it and I actually think there are many physicians like me across the country who are all for it. As a citizen, though, I will say that I am not particularly interested in importing the healthcare system of the Netherlands, Senator Ogilvie, but I would say that I would be very happy to pay their marginal tax rate and I wonder if you would also. Thank you. <laughs> I think each time we get into a discussion over uh, actually bringing about change in anything in the public area in Canada, it is very easy to throw in uh, the, the, the evil of profit-driven uh, organ, uh, organizations um, as a red herring to divert uh, the dialogue from the underlying issue. It's like bringing in two-tier. The minute you get on a discussion and somebody throws in two-tier, uh, people dive under their tables and, and refuse to... Uh, uh, consider discuss the issue. The issue is uh, bringing about innovation in a system uh, that brings about a higher degree of delivery. And the innovation issue uh, must take into consideration a range of possibilities of doing so. And I want to come back to the family physician. In fact, what uh, is very clear uh, in this country is the frontline physician is a key uh, to uh, the future of healthcare uh, in this country and where uh, innovation has broken down substantially is in not allowing um, uh, frontline providers who have been really quite innovative in developing clinics where they attempt to, as I tried to indicate as an example, uh, bring together with nurse practitioners and some testing a clinic that will do a number of things at the early uh, level for uh, issues that need more than one intervention uh, to treat. And a number of those have been closed down because there wasn't a way uh, to work out a billing system for that to be accommodated uh, within the area. But it was the CMA, among others, who uh, clearly and testified before us that we have to bring about innovation in this area. The idea that people wind up at emergency rooms for aspirins uh, and add an enormous cost burden to uh, the cost of delivery, surely to goodness, we don't have to get off in an argument about some evil private corporation uh, and therefore we shouldn't get into uh, innovation. That's the end down there. It doesn't even have to get anywhere near the private issue. We should be able to develop innovative ways that Canadian citizens can interface with health care at an early stage and not all wind up in the emergency room of hospitals. Minister Matthews. Uh, I couldn't agree more. We've got too many people going to the emergency departments who, uh, who, shouldn't, who should be cared for by the primary care provider. That's why we absolutely need more after hours care. We need to start measuring the access to same day, next day appointments. We don't fare well when we compare ourselves to other jurisdictions on uh, same day, next day. Um, and we have a much higher utilization of our emergency departments. So there are opportunities to go there. Primary care is the key. The Bernice story that I talked about, that is care that needs to be coordinated by the primary care provider working in a team with other health care providers. So I, I'm not sure whether we're disagreeing or agreeing on this, but there's work to do and there's work underway in Ontario. Okay, I'm just going to mention we are about five minutes away from a break, and I've got quite a long list of speakers here. So I'm going to probably cut it off at this point because we have two things that we have to read into the record from our satellite sites. We have Mike McBain, Robin Tamblin. I, I then want to just read you a, a, something from UVic that's come in. Um, then we have a, a comment over here, and then I have another tweet to read in, and Dennis Kendall. Um, and I think if we have enough time, we might do one more, but that's probably going to be it before we take a break. So. Uh, if we can make these trekur, Michael. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Lillian. It's an honor to be here. I want to thank Casper for organizing it, the focus on evidence, and it's an honor, and I think, to tribute to uh, Roy Romano, this, this turnout today. It's very exciting. Um, I wanted to thank Minister Matthews for speaking on behalf of Canadians' values and vision of our country when it comes to healthcare. And I want to thank Joe Gallagher 
for his description of a very creative process that's emerging in British Columbia around Aboriginal health. I have a quick comment and a, and a question for Senator Ogilvy. Um, I was really pleased with your report, but very displeased with your presentation today. I didn't think it reflected the report that much, uh, particularly when you, when you talked about the Canada Health Act in private delivery. Um, in 2004, Health Canada said that private delivery actually uh, can violate the Canada Health Act when it allows queue jumping. And there's a lot of risk involved in private delivery. This is from Health Canada. Their interpretation of the Canada Health Act is very different from what you presented. And it said that Health Canada is free to point out there's no evidence that private delivery is more cost effective or higher quality or more efficient than public delivery. So this is, this is the view of, of the Government of Canada's health experts. Now, the other question I had is, did I hear your presentation correctly that health care is provincial? Because uh, in my mind, health care is shared jurisdiction, and we as a country decided to use a spending power in our constitution to establish national standards. And that's a key role of the federal government, not to mention it's the fifth largest direct deliverer of services and a really important regulator of food and drug safety. There's a, mist of, um, a list a mile long of federal, unique federal jurisdictions in the area of health. So uh, I'd like a clarification there from the senator. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I want to go back and tell you what I said at the start of my talk, and that is that uh, part of it I was going to be speaking as chair of the Senate committee, which I did at the beginning and went over the uh, what uh, uh, in the first few slides what we heard uh, with regard to our review of the health accord and that I was speaking as an individual and that's where uh, when I moved across the uh, uh, the direct uh, statements about what we heard I went into uh, speaking uh, as a Canadian citizen. The um, issue with regard to jurisdiction is not as simple as uh, you might have implied. It's a very complex issue uh, but it basically comes down to provinces having uh, primary jurisdiction with regard to the uh, delivery of health care, and they have complicated issues with regard to perhaps their municipalities and so on. But it's a provincial, it depends on the province to some degree, but it's a provincial authority under our, uh, our uh, constitution, as I uh, and my uh, committee and others on the Hill have been so thoroughly briefed in the recent days. And, it would take us a while, a lot of time to spend a lot of time on that, and I don't, I don't think that's really useful. I do want to uh, come back uh, clearly something I uh, used as an example wasn't understood. Uh, when I, uh, in the implication that I think these uh, two should be divides, that is not the case whatsoever. In fact, I used the uh, uh, evolving Canadian, that is federal, provincial, and territorial response to pandemics as a clear example of how uh, provinces and territories and the federal government can work together and that the federal government can use its good offices to help facilitate uh, those kinds of dialogues when we get down to discussing the issue itself and not in the great public debate that seems always to be just on uh, the, the, how much the federal government should contribute or whose fault it is in not paying enough uh, for health care in Canada. I believe very strongly that the federal government has a clear role in helping to facilitate the dialogue on the key issues within the system, but that battle shouldn't be a continuous one over who pays uh, uh, how much. Yeah, I'll be brief. I know we're uh, short of time. I just want to think it's important that we make a distinction between delivery of health care and setting national aspirations. And I, you know, I think we all agree that uh, delivery of health care belongs in the provinces except, of course, for the federal government, the fifth, larger, fifth largest delivery, uh, deliverer of health care uh, for First Nations people in particular. Um, so we're happy to take on the responsibility of, uh, of delivery, but I do think the national debate, the, the national conversation that happened when Roy Romano did his work, the national conversation that happened was a very constructive and positive um, a time in our in our history as Canadians. I believe that a Canadian should get access to comparable care whether they live in British Columbia or Prince Edward Island. I don't think it should look different in every single province. And that's why when we did, did set targets 
Let's move on wait times. It was a problem across, across the country. Let's bring those wait times down. We've made remarkable progress nationally. Happy to say Ontario's gone fastest, but nationally, <laughs> we've made great progress because collectively we decided to do it. So the, the federal government, in my opinion, has a moral responsibility. We can argue about whether there's a legal responsibility. Absolutely has a moral responsibility to be there as a champion for Canada's health care. Excellent. Robin Tamblin, and I'm going to ask everybody else to make these relatively brief, and maybe we'll just have them as being um, mostly comments rather than engagement and questions, unless... Thanks, I did, I'll make it really quick. I even wrote it down so I wouldn't run off at the Well time. done. Yeah, so I'm the Scientific Director for the Institute for Health Services and Policy Research. Nobody can hear you, Robin. Scientific Director of the Institute of Health Services and Policy Research, Does also known as ISHPR. Okay. Okay, so two quick questions. One, I, to I totally am uh, embracing this idea that we need innovation. Uh, I think this is a fabulous idea. And one question that I have really is why the investment actually in R&D in health services is so low. It really is about 1% of the 200 billion that is spent every year on health care. If we compare ourselves with other industries that want innovation and they want change and they want to be at the leading edge, they're up at, let's say if we take Israel, 15%. So there must be something wrong. We're not doing it the right way. We're not saying it the right way. Research is a bad word. I don't really know what. But I think we need to fix this if we're really going to actually get the innovation we need to, to move forward. It really has to be at the grassroots level, and it needs to be embraced within the, the kind of structured way that research uh, can, can do. And if I, my second point quickly is to thank Joe so much for being so inspirational. I think this is fabulous, and I think this is just an example of the kind of innovation that we would hope to see in our country of, of sticking in difficult problems that have been hard to solve. Uh, you brought an issue forward which, has, which hasn't really been discussed at any great length here, and that's about wellness. Uh, mm -hmm. It was the Lalonde Report 40 years ago. Uh, and I'm kind of concerned that we haven't really dealt with the social determinants of health. Uh, Canada was a success story when it comes to smoking. We did it really well. And you look at the top three, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and respiratory disease that clog up the emergency rooms and, and lead us to premature mortality. It was smoking that was the culprit. It's not going to be dealt with through health care. The next big culprit is going to be obesity. Uh, and so we, we, if we don't deal with that tsunami, and that's coming, then, then I think that we'll have lost the battle. So, I'd love to hear the panel's response on how they think we should do that, and of course, to my first and most favorite question of all, of course. Let's answer the R&D one, but the second one I'm going to hold because we have a question from you, Vic, that ties in very nicely, and we'll follow that up. Oh, well, the, there is no question we need uh, more investment uh, in research with regard to innovation. In fact, uh, I, I hope I conveyed that uh, what we heard consistently uh, from all those appearing before us was the need uh, for uh, innovation, and they all the one point that came across continuously was that increases in the funding on an annual basis should go to support innovation. And Recommendation 34 says that the federal government taking the lead, uh, work with, work with uh, provincial and territorial governments to establish a Canadian Health Innovation Fund to identify and implement innovative and best practice models in the health care delivery and the dissemination of these examples across the health system. Just as an example. As an example of the many other things that will follow in terms of R&D. Did you want to respond, Minister, or no? Well, uh, yeah, I just want to make one comment. I will make it quick. Um, yes, we need to continue to innovate, absolutely. But we, all, we know a whole lot more that we're not applying. And for me, actually moving from those great new ideas to actually applying the things we know that already work. I see Doris Grinspan is here from uh, Registered Nurses Association of Ontario. They're doing fabulous uh, work on best practice guidelines, getting, getting the knowledge we already have applied in uh, clinical settings. So, so I'm not saying we don't need to do more on the innovation front, but I am saying we absolutely need to do more on the apl applying the knowledge that we already have. 
So I'm just going to go to this question here uh, from uh, the University of Victoria. Sorry, Robin. Um, this goes like this. I know you want more for research and development. That goes down. Check. Got it. Um, what, when is the conversation about the future of healthcare going to embrace the broader issue of health from a life course perspective and the various aspects of public policy that seem not to be talked about? Housing, the nature and quality of work, the nature and quality of work, income and its distribution, affordable childcare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So when exactly is that going to become part of the debate? And we really do uh, celebrate what's happening in terms of the First Nations Health Authority, starting from that kind of perspective and saying, let's look from there and out. But um, any observations there, Senator? Uh, well, just very quickly, in our report, we identified social determinants as a critical basis of uh, the future of health care. I, I want to elaborate. doing it. <laughs> okay. Just real quickly, um, I do appreciate the comment and I think for us as, as First Nations people, we bring the philosophy of a holistic approach to our work and our lives on an everyday basis. So it's not something that we're forgotten. And um, I just wanted to say, and as our elders have always told me, you only need to be told once and then you got to do it. And I think that's really what needs to happen in a lot of these situations. <laughs> And, and my uh, addition to this conversation is that when you do look at the top 1% or the top 5% of our healthcare users, you'll see a lot of people with, with issues related to mental illness, with uh, poverty issues. So as we focus on those people who really are uh, big consumers of our healthcare, uh, we will have no choice but to address the social determinants of health. <laughs> 